Well, hello everybody and welcome to Blue Marble Science. Let's talk about airplanes, helicopters, and other things that don't care about Coriolis, including me. Well, actually, I do care about Coriolis. But today's show is going to be a little bit different than normal. All our warnings have expired. We're not going to talk about any of those guys. We're just going to talk about Coriolis airplanes and helicopters. So, I don't think the oven mitts are going to be necessary. And hey, Gladys. How about some marshmallows? What do you mean we're out of marshmallows? You ate all the marshmallows again? Before we start talking about airplanes and helicopters, let's just go over what Coriolis Force is one more time. Coriolis is the effect or the apparent deflection of the path of an object that is moving in a rotating coordinate system or a rotating reference frame. The object doesn't actually deviate from its straight path, but it appears to do so because of the motion of the coordinate system. Here's a short video from the Artificial Gravity Lab that uh, demonstrates this and gives you a little more explanation. Going on, and things go wrong very quickly. You now move your arm and try to go as straight as you can. Oh! <laughs> oh, I moved my head. You shouldn't move your head. Do you get used to this? Yeah, yeah you get used to it, yeah. You can adapt. Move your arms and try to feel this force that is... Oh, that I is. Okay, just to be clear, I'm not putting this on. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm, the signals I'm giving to my muscles are move my arms forward. And I, now I'm forcing them. But I'm, I'm pushing against a force here. If you keep going, at some point, you won't feel the force anymore. Oh, that's weird. That's weird, right? That's so weird. So now you are adapted. So if I try and do anything else, I haven't adjusted to it. But that specific movement, my body's got used to. That's right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> One way to visualize this force is for me to try and throw a little tennis ball at you. I will uh, throw it straight at you and okay. see what happens, OK? Whoa! What? <laughs> I'm struggling to work this out with the Fitbit. Because in my head, this is a normal reference frame. But it's clear. We are rotating. And now I'm going to throw it over there. Yeah. And hopefully it's going to get at you. OK. Are you ready? Yeah, right. Yes! Oh, nice. <laughs> Great. <laughs> wow. All those artifacts are from the Coriolis force. It's not a real force acting on the ball, but it looks like one when you're in that weird rotating environment. Have a look at this 360 degree image of the lab. Now, it's a little distorted because it's from a single camera in the middle, but it's close enough. Here's the tricky part. The circumference of a circle is longer the further out you go from the middle. But because everything in that circle is rotating at the same speed once around every six seconds, things on the outside have farther to travel. So they're moving at a faster speed than things on the inside. On the outside, we're moving pretty fast, but that camera in the middle is just spinning on the spot. So let's mark the sideways speed that everything is moving at relative to the rest of the world. Green is fast, red is slow. When you throw a ball across that room, it keeps that sideways speed that it had when it left your hand as it travels into slower moving areas of the room. Now out at the edge, that was fine. It was going the same speed as everything around it, so it looked like it aimed for the center. But by the time it starts to get there, it's a missile flying outwards compared to everything around it. Now from the outside, that makes sense. After it leaves your hand, the ball just moves in a straight line. From the inside, it looks like there's a force suddenly sending it sideways, and that is the Coriolis force. And it's not something your brain has evolved to deal with. That's a good demonstration of what happens to objects that are moving in a rotating frame of reference. So now, let's figure out what happens to an airplane. And to do that, let's take a flight from Valparaiso, Indiana, down to Nashville, Tennessee. I've made this flight myself many times. I'm going to fly down there today at 9,500 feet. I've got about 320 nautical miles in route. The course is almost due south, 177 degrees. But today we've got a wind that's out of 260 degrees at 22 knots. So eventually we're going to have to deal with that. Now the airplane we're going to fly is this M20F. 
It has an airspeed of 165 knots and it weighs about 1240 kilograms when it's fully loaded. Calculating the Coriolis effect on an aircraft or any other object for that matter is very straightforward. You can see the formula there on the left. I plugged it into an online calculator and you come up with a force that will be against the left side of the airplane since we're flying south of 9.416 newtons. That's about 2.25 pounds. 2.25 pounds of force against a 2700 pound airplane. It's not a lot, but it would still make a slight difference. The Coriolis acceleration is 0 0.007593 meters per second squared. Well, what does that look like graphically? It's like this. The airplane is going to be deflected to the right because of the Coriolis force. And we need a correction to the left, to the east, to account for that. One way we could do that is a bank angle correction. We could simply bank the aircraft slightly to the left to match the Coriolis uh, acceleration. And we end up with about a 0 0.044 degree bank correction. Now, in reality, a pilot would probably elect to do a side slip maneuver, but we won't even go into that. We'll just use this uh, bank angle correction. So what does that look like on the airplane? Well, the correction is going to be to the left, and so the left wing is going to be low, and the right wing is going to be high. And 0 0.044 degrees on that Mooney is less than 0.17 inches from the wing tip down to parallel. A bank correction of 0 0.044 is far too small to be practical. I would never even consider trying that. Instead, we're simply going to track the course that we're trying to fly and make small corrections as necessary along the way. And that's how it's done in reality. But we got another issue. We got wind. Let's imagine we've got a pond and a little rubber boat on one side and we want to paddle across the pond to where that red X is on the other side. That's simple enough. Just paddle straight at the X. No problem. But what if that's not a pond? What if that's a creek that's got flowing water in it? Now if I try to paddle straight at that X over there, the current in the river is going to take the boat over here. I'm going to end up in that position, and that's not where I want to be. So what do we do about that? Well, we simply aim upstream. We simply angle the boat upstream, and as we paddle across, the current will keep us straight, and we'll end up where we wanted to be to begin with. Now, air behaves just like water in that respect. When we have a crosswind, all we have to do is aim the airplane a little bit into that wind, just like we aim the boat into the current. Let's see what that amounts to. Again, our wind is out of 260 degrees at 22 knots. Now, putting that in a wind correction angle calculator, if we fly a heading of 185 degrees, that's a wind correction angle of 8 degrees. It'll look like that, and we will track our course of 177 degrees. The ground speed will be reduced by about 4 knots. That's to be expected. It's a slight uh, headwind. But that's how we do it in reality. So what are we looking at here? An 8 degree wind correction, which is easy enough to do, but a 0 0.044 degree bank correction for Coriolis? No, we don't do that. That's the reason why pilots say we don't take Coriolis into account. We don't because the correction is so slight we can't take it into account. It makes no sense. Now, we've already talked about helicopters in a previous uh, video, but we'll just say it one more time. A hovering helicopter proves nothing about Coriolis, 
and the concept that a helicopter can just simply hover in one spot without any control input to it is ridiculous. Hovering a helicopter is a very difficult thing to do. It involves both feet, both hands, and all of that has to be in continuous motion if you want to hope to stay over a single spot. Here's the bottom line to it. Hovering helicopters are not subject to any Coriolis force. They're not moving in the rotating frame of reference. The control inputs required to hover are totally overwhelming compared to any Coriolis correction. For fixed wing airplanes, wind correction is orders of magnitude greater than the bank correction needed to account for Coriolis. So while Coriolis is present, the effect is too minor for us to account for it. I hope that helps clear some things up. And I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'd appreciate some feedback on whether you'd like to see more of this sort of thing. In the meantime, if you liked it, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons down there. And we'll catch you on the next one. Hey Gladys. Uh -huh. We're out of here.